Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and welcome to the 14th class in our uh, lecture series on understanding contemporary art. Right now we're in the midst of a discussion about the works of Jean-Michel Basquiat. And um, so last time we talked about the first half of his oeuvre and how it was concerned with a quest for some kind of an apparatus of semiotic capture that would capture all the floating signifiers. The problem that we have today in the age of information overload is that we've got signifiers running around rampant. They're just running around amok like escaped zoo animals with no cages to keep them, to, to hold them in place. And so one of the jobs of the artist in such a society is to try to create through his art apparatuses of semiotic capture which will lock these signifiers into place and prevent them from invading the psyche and destabilizing it. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing and what we've been seeing for the past several decades in our post-World War II post-historic capitalist consumer hyper-reality civilization. If we look at um, a couple of Basquiat's paintings here, this one is Siena from 1984, uh, and we can see how it's composed of these uh, sort of glowing signifiers and these corporate logos. And this one here uh, is called Melting Point. Um, these are from 1984. If we looked at them and we did a thought experiment and we tried to imagine uh, what his art would look like if we turned them on and sent electric current racing into it, Let's say we, we somehow had the magical means of connecting them to a plug, plugging them in, and turning them on. What do we think might happen? What would be the resulting vision that, that might come out of this? And I think that the parallel could be found in the novels of William Gibson, uh, who was an artist who was working uh, at exactly the same time as Basquiat in the 80s. His novel Neuromancer came out in 1984. And in that novel, William Gibson invented this concept of what he called cyberspace, which is essentially uh, a foreshadowing of the coming of the internet, but it also is composed basically of the same kinds of information overload as Basquiat's art. Uh, floating ads, uh, corporate logos, voodoo gods, all of that stuff is shared in common in the canvases of Basquiat, especially these later ones, and in the novels of William Gibson. And I think that both artists are, and especially William Gibson, is of course looking ahead to the coming of the internet. And the internet, I think, um, is really what Basquiat uh, as an artist is so, sort of being prescient of here. The, the need for something like the internet, which becomes an electronic apparatus of semiotic capture that takes all the signifiers of the city space, the ads, the billboards, the, the graffiti, the logos, takes them all and puts them on the inside into an electromagnetic world interior that captures them. They're still floating, they're still drifting, they're still discarnate, but at least they're organized into a single space. And I think that um, the internet then becomes a kind of symbolic within. It becomes a world interior of the consciousness of the city itself. It's the within of the city. And I think we can see uh, these two artists, Basquiat and Gibson in his science fiction novels, already looking ahead to the coming of the, the necessity for the internet. The artist is always prescient. He's, as we've seen over and over again in this video series, that the artist is always a jump ahead of what's coming down the road. Um, <clears throat> Now, in uh, late 84 and 1985, um, Basquiat did a series of collaborations with his favorite artist, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol was the god of pop art who had opened all the doors for Basquiat. And Basquiat and, uh, idolized him, perhaps envied him. But they did a series of collaborations. This one is one of them here. This is Arm and Hammer from about 1985, in which we can see that uh, the interesting thing about it is that Warhol now plays the role of the world of the corporate signifier. He creates the Arm & Hammer logo here, and it becomes the, the world of advertising and capitalist consumer mass culture. And Basquiat then continues to play his role of the graffiti artist who comes along and defaces the monuments or the public uh, spaces and signifiers of the world, uh, the, the exterior world of capital, and defaces it by putting these comments on them, uh, sort of uh, these little graffiti marks. And here's another one of their uh, collaborations, collaboration uh, from 1984. 85, and then this is another one from about the same period, Pontiac number five. But again, you can see that Warhol's trademark here is the capitalist consumer iconotype. Basquiat's trademark is the abandoned city wall that he is defacing uh, by painting graffiti onto these images. Now, there is a problem here, I think, that, 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 that begins to become manifest in that it tends to reduce Basquiat to the role of a supplement to Warhol. Um, Basquiat, in a sense, becomes an apprentice to Warhol. It's almost like Leonardo when he started out uh, painting the, the folds of the robe 
onto Verrocchio's ca canvas. He was the apprentice to Verrocchio and, and painted, uh, he was basically supplemental to the master. But Basquiat had already attained the status of a master by this point, a master of contemporary art. And to, to put him in the role of merely making comments onto the artwork of Andy Warhol was to cast him into the role of a kind of Derridian supplement. So he, his status becomes reduced to that of an apprentice at the end of his career rather than at the beginning of it. And I think that, um, and sometimes in uh, contemporary hypermodernity, the effects come before the causes. With, in an electronic society in which information is beaming at you from all directions, it can upset the causal sequences, as Einstein had already figured out. Um, but I think that this had a negative effect on, on uh, Basquiat and destabilized. It began to set in perturbations that began to ripple through his art that destabilized his art because the art as it progresses after this um, tends to decline. It's not as good as it used to be. This is to be titled of 1987. And here we can see that the art begins to take on a kind of sketchbook cartoony quality that looks like a series of doodles drawn by a bored man on the pages of a sketchbook. Uh, this is another one here from the later period, Riddle Me This Batman from 1987. This also has the same kind of comic booky, well, not even comic booky, it has a kind of sketchbook quality. And uh, then here's another one. For, um, this one is uh, Victor 25, 448, also from 1987. And I think it begins to become pretty clear by looking at these latter three paintings that Basquiat's art is going down the drain. Part of the problem is now that he has shifted out, his ontology has shifted from that of the abandoned city wall, which was the central key archetype, the kind of master signifier that had made sense out of his art all along. It had always cast him in the unfortunate role of being on the outside and being always an outsider. Uh, whereas Warhol for him personified the ultimate inside of art and to get to do collaborations with Warhol was for him a dream come true because it put him at the inside of art. But the fact that he was always, that his central conceit was to be the graffiti artist on the outside of the city that had turned its back to him, cast him in a permanent ontological status of always being on the outside of art. So he was forever an outsider no matter what he did. But I think the shift in these later paintings from that of the ontology of the abandoned city wall to the sketchbooks of a bored artist uh, was not a good shift, and I think it is a diminishment and a decline in Basquiat's art. I think the drug use was also getting worse. The heroin usage was getting worse. Also, success hit him pretty hard, as it did Jack Jackson Pollock. Uh, Basquiat became one of the wealthiest artists alive during the 1980s, and I don't think uh, that he dealt with the success very well. Um, this is one of his last paintings, and it's probably the best one from this period. This is Writing with Death. And even though it's one of the best from the period, I think it still has a kind of sketchy, tentative quality that renders its status as a great work of art questionable. Um, and I think that um, he was going; his art was going down the drain, and it, it, it evidently is is uh, on the way out here. So with Jean-Michel Basquiat um, at the tail end of his career, Andy Warhol died uh, in February of 1987, and then Basquiat himself died of a combined overdose of heroin and cocaine in August of 1988, about a year and a half later, Warhol was for him the god, and I think that the disappearance of Warhol in, in physical reality from his cosmos left a kind of semiotic vacancy there for him that he was never able to fill and that created a kind of sucking vortex in his psyche that drew him gradually, drew his consciousness down the drain uh, into um, accelerating the usage and plus the, the access to the endless amounts of cash made it very easy for him to get drugs and they accelerated the usage of the drugs so that he became, to go on the inside into the drug trance became much more preferable to being on the outside as the city artist painting on the, the painting graffiti in commentary on the walls of the, the world city. And so that's my overview of the art of Jean-Michel Basquiat. We'll end there for that.